Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Football Insomnia podcast. I'm your host, Colin Watt. What I'm actually delighted about is the guest that we've got today, um, and it is none other than Sky Sports' own Anthony Joseph. Joining us all the way from London, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, all good, thanks, Colin. Glad your internet's working again. But uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure, pleasure to be on the show. No, I'm a big fan of it, and uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be on. And just like uh, with Anthony Haggerty last week, I'll send that £20 in the post for saying that, so thanks very much. Um, but no, we're delighted to be live today on YouTube, on Facebook and on Twitter. If you are watching, uh, leave us a like. The channel's at nearly 9,500 subscribers, so we're going really well. Um, and if you have any questions for Anthony, leave them in the comments section. Um, and when we get to it later on, I will um, go through them and get some of them answered. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots about your journalism career so far. Um, maybe not so much about being up in the, the Aberdeen area, working for the Aberdeen newspapers, probably more about the Sky Sports, but we'll get to that um, shortly. We are going to discuss the week's football talking points first before we get to that, um, and we'll also hear who Anthony would have over to his house um, from the world of football for a dinner. So do get involved. This is an interactive show. Leave your comments, um, and we'll bring them up on the screen. But first of all, let's talk about the... European football return. So, first of all, the Champions League's back. It was back last night. Um, two big games. PSG running away with a 4-1 victory in the new Camp. Liverpool taking advantage of some of the, the poor defending um, to, to take a 2-0 lead back to, to Anfield. I mean, it's great to have the, the European football back. Anthony, what I'm going to get from you is your thoughts on the games this week and who you would tip to go and win the tournament this year. So, first of all, last night's games, what was your your takeaway from them? Um, well, two, first of all, it was two big games, especially uh, with Liverpool and Leipzig and then also Barca PSG with Pochettino in charge of PSG. That was <laughs> a whitewash it turned out to be, but it was, it wasn't looking like that when Messi, when Messi got the, the penalty. But Mbappe... Again, just showing how much of a world-class player he is um, with the hat-trick. And Pochettino is a very good manager to have at PSG. I think a lot of English Premier League clubs would have been looking at him. Maybe if the pandemic hadn't happened, uh, man, he might he might be at Man United by now. But uh, PSG, very lucky to have him. And if you're, you're asking who, I'm, who I might tip to win the Champions League, I would... Would maybe say PSG as an outside an outside bet, but uh, uh, saying that I know that they'll probably get knocked out or something like that in dramatic <laughs> in the next night. But uh, yeah, uh, Liverpool a huge win for them because of what's going on in the league. The Champions League is going to have to be their focus. Jurgen Klopp has already conceded the title. He said there's no chance um, they're going to catch Man City. So it's. The Champions League has got to be the focus for them, and that's a huge win at uh, Leipzig, who are a very good team um, with Nagelsmann in charge. So, yeah, you could, could see them going going through, and we'll, we'll see we'll see how they get in the next round if they, if they go through. I mean, looking at some of the ties, as you said, Barcelona, PSG, the Neymar derby, um, even though he wasn't playing, it was a fantastic result. And you take a look at someone like Kylian Mbappe, uh, he's still very, very young. I think he's only, is it 20 or 21 now? And he's got over 140 career goals. I think for me, he is going to be the one that stands out. You've had this period of uh, Messi and Ronaldo. There's never been anyone really up there to challenge them. But I think um, Mbappe is a complete different type of player. He's a natural born goal scorer. And there's only really two of them in the world right now. And I would say that's Mbappe and um, Haaland at Dortmund. And I think they could be the ones that are the next sort of Ronaldo and Messi. But it goes back to the old school, out and out number nine striker. Yeah, and that I think I think you're right in terms of they're probably the next generation of the Ronaldo and Messi, aren't they? Because yeah. there's there's world class, and then there's Ronaldo and Messi who are just on another level. Um, probably that the world has ever seen in football, and Haaland and Mbappe are, are, are getting there and they, they at such a young age they're already performing to the levels of maybe just under Ronaldo and Messi but above the rest of the players who we, we would consider world class and 
who knows? They might they might even surpass uh, Ronaldo and Messi. That's a, that's a scary thought, but we'll see. So, looking at the games tonight, Porto v Juve, Sevilla v Dortmund. Be interested to see how Haaland does. As a journalist down in England, what's the thoughts on Haaland? Is there rumours that he's going to be playing in the Premier League? There's always rumours of um, any good player from Europe playing in the Premier League. Um, I think it's just, is he not a Leeds fan? Um, his dad used to play for Leeds, yeah. yeah. His dad used to play for Leeds, and I'm sure he's a Leeds United fan as well. That would be some story if he ended up at Leeds of all clubs. Um, a huge club, but uh, you wouldn't really class them in the elite level um, yet anyway. It's... I mean, he's what kind of fee would he command? If they're talking about 100 million, 120 million for Sancho, what would Haaland cost? Uh, mm-hmm. What would Dortmund accept? You, you'd think only like PSG, Man City, Real Madrid maybe could afford him. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what. How, and he would have to engineer that move as well because yeah. Dortmund not give up a player of that caliber too easily. Uh- I think, uh, and I might be wrong, I'm sure someone in the comment section will let us know, I'm pretty sure Haaland has a buyout clause in his contract um, that becomes activated, I think it's this summer or next summer, for about £80-90 million. And when you look at it, £80-90 million to get you the kind of goals that he gets, that can win someone the Champions League, that could win someone the Premier League, and it would pay for itself, I think. Well, what a bargain that would be considering the likes of Man United would pay £80 million or whatever for Harry Maguire. So <laughs> what a bargain that would be for to get Alan at that price. There's, a, there's, a, there's plenty of Harry Maguire bashing on this um, <laughs> podcast. I, I said previously that um, I think his transfer fee was the first fee that was calculated by a uh, square inch of his forehead um, because he's not a very good footballer, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, no. Some comments. You, some comments. <laughs> Definitely, I can agree with you. Some comments coming in already. Contact sixty seven saying, I "Think it's more than possible for Mbappe to be on a level with Messi and Ronaldo before he retires." Mm. I, I'm not sure. Clarify on that one. I love the picture of Lemmy, by the way. Um, clarify on that one. Is it before Messi and Ronaldo retires, um, or before Mbappe retires? Because I think definitely he will be on that level. I mean, he's mm. still got another ten, fifteen years left in him. Yeah. Definitely, and uh, barring a bad injury, which we don't, obviously don't wish on anyone, he is on course to to be at that level and maybe even surpass it. Yeah, definitely. Looking ahead to next week, because there is games next week as well, Contact's just saying it was before Mbappe retires, and I think definitely he will. Um, looking ahead to next week's games, the, the tie of that round for me is really Atletico Madrid versus Chelsea. Um, Atletico Madrid riding high at the top of La Liga Chelsea just recently um, taking over a new manager four wins in a row starting to come into a bit of form and for me I know you said that you fancy PSG I fancy Atletico to do well this year I think they would be my outside tip to to go on and win the whole tournament and it really starts with uh, this game against Chelsea if they get through that who knows who they could get in the next round Yeah and Chelsea have been impressive since they've had Tuchel in in charge have gone from what ninth in the table to fourth in the, in the matter of weeks it just shows that I think when you have a, a manager of that calibre that kind of class you will he will deliver results um, that's not bashing Frank Lampard but he was I think he was in a job that was maybe too big for him at yeah. the stage of that in his career and I think that's been said quite widely um, amongst pundits and, and journalists as well but uh, yeah, t- that's going to be an interesting game. It's a shame Diego Costa is is no longer at uh, Atletico, but uh, that because that would have been an interesting uh, battle being back at Chelsea. But uh, yeah, another I would say that is the tie around next week in uh, Atletico. Yeah, I can see them being doing well in this tournament. Yeah, I think they, they definitely have surprised quite a few people this year, especially being so far in front in La Liga. But they've also really recruited well as well. Um, mm-hmm. You take a look at it up front, guys like Jal Phoenix, they've also got um, uh, Suarez that they picked up for absolutely next to nothing from Barcelona. So um, they're putting together quite a good team there. One of the, the kind of interesting talking points out of next week's games as well is uh, Borussia mentioned Gladbach versus Man City game. Um, mm-hmm. And it came out this week that uh, Gladbach manager Marco Rose is going to be going to Borussia Dortmund next season. Mm. Considering that the season has still got quite a bit to go, it's quite a strange move for 
him to announce his, his plans, especially when they're still in the Champions League? Yeah, you don't often see it, especially at that kind of level um, in the Bundesliga or any of the top leagues, you don't see that kind of uh, announcement so soon just to say that there's that. But it shows there's, there's clubs there that have that kind of succession planning where they know who, they, know who they want for the next season. They, they're still in the Champions League. They're still in the um, d- doing well in the league, but they feel there's a change needed and they've got that succession planning um, and, and getting in Marco Rose, from, who is already at, doing well at Borussia Mönchengladbach. It, it just shows that kind of long-term thinking of, of clubs at that level. It, I think it's maybe something that um, some teams maybe closer to home could be looking to do in succession planning as well. <laughs> um, but, um, but I'm sure everyone will have their, their thoughts on that. So you're going for PSG. I'm going for Atletico Madrid. Um, the one team I think we should all keep an eye on this season um, in the Champions League is Atalanta. Uh, I really think that they could surprise a couple of people. They're up against Real Madrid in the, uh, the games next week. Been out of form completely this season, Real Madrid. Um, so that could be the shock of the round if they knock them out, in my opinion. Yeah, they've been so hit or miss and they've had a few shockers in the Champions League already. I think they were yep. uh, quite lucky to get through their group stage. But uh, yeah, Atalanta would be... It's one of those stories, I guess, like Ajax um, a few years ago where you saw them uh, reach the semi-finals. I know Ajax are much mm-hmm. bigger club, but it's, it's nice to have it's nice to have a team breaking the mould or an exception to the norm. And it would be good to... It'd be amazing if they uh, could beat Real Madrid. That'd be, despite Real Madrid's poor form, that would still be something. Definitely. And before we go and take a look at the Europa League, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the comments that are coming through. Um, we've got Joe Porter, um, who says here that, how can Barcelona and Real escape fair play regulations at over a billion pound in debt apiece and still go out to spend millions, I think? That kind of period of spending millions will probably change this summer. There's been a lot of um, sort of results coming out in recent weeks to suggest that they can't afford to do things like that. I've seen a thing saying that Barcelona aren't going to play Philip Coutinho for the rest of the season because they can't afford part of his transfer fee. Um, so I think that the balance in football will certainly change over the next few years. Um, Red Flutch coming in here saying, if Haaland goes to Man City, it's game over. Um uh, definitely um, and that would be quite an interesting move seeing him at Man City um, and he also says they thinks they're in for Grealish too uh, City have just got that kind of money that they can spend despite yeah. the, the financial fair play because of the sponsorship deals yeah definitely and uh, it's just, it's the type of owners they've got as well and what they are uh, how they make their money and, and how they work it around like you say the type of ownership they have and I would say the only club able to compete like that would be PSG. So I think it's one to watch on where Haaland would go, if he goes, because Dortmund are still such a great club to be at. Yep. And challenge in the Champions League. And uh, I know it was Bayern are going for nine in a row, aren't they? But still, Dortmund are always up there in the Bundesliga. Definitely. And uh, Matthew Duff in here, I think, backing up my point, he fancies Atletico and he fancies Moussa Dembele to score the winner in the final, that would be some fairy tale for him. I would happily lose my PSG shout if there's a demolition in the final <laughs> with that to go. <laughs> I think we've, we're all supporting uh, Moussa Dembele. Um, so let's take a look at the Europa League. And I'm just going to pull out, obviously it's a round of 32 there, so there's quite a lot of ties. Um, but let's take a look at the ties involving the teams from the UK. We've got Real Sociedad versus Manchester United, also known as the Davy Moyes Derby. Um, Slavia Prague versus Leicester. Wolfsberger versus Spurs. Probably the tie of the round in Benfica versus Arsenal. And also Antwerp versus Rangers. Out of the five uh, UK teams that are still left, how many of them do you think will go through? Oh, good question. Um, Four. I think we'll go through. I could see Sociedad maybe upsetting uh, Man United, actually, because they're doing, they're doing really well in the league at the moment. So they're mm-hmm. pushing for Champions League spots. Um, and Man United just have... They're not 
massively in a title race, but they are they are close, uh, and they could be within touching. They're the only team maybe that could actually challenge um, City properly. I, I don't know. I just try to think whether we'll see what time, kind of teams they put out as well. How how seriously mm-hmm. the, the English teams usually take the, the latter stages seriously when they play a lot of their kids um, during the group stage. But so see that are a good team, and I think that might be the one where where there might be a little upset. I think for me, I, I agree with you on four, but I mm. think it'll be Slavia Prague that could knock out Leicester. You look at mm. Slavia Prague in the group stage, they beat Beersheba, Nice and Bayer Leverkusen there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, Leicester are on a good run of form, but I, I think they might prioritise the league position over the Europa League this season. Um, and I could maybe see them knocking them out. I think Spurs will get past Wolfsberger, um, Arsenal, Benfica, now, this is an interesting tie because this has been played at two neutral grounds. There's no home advantage for either team there um, because of the, the COVID regulations at the minute. So that could be one that causes an upset. And just as Joe Porter comes in to say there, he reckons Benfica will hammer Arsenal. Now, Arsenal's defence this season have been very poor um, and yeah. Benfica are certainly doing very well in the Portuguese league. So that could be one that causes a big upset as well. Yeah, and it just shows the craziness of the world we're in and the craziness of football at the moment, doesn't it? That uh, Arsenal can't travel to Portugal and back and and Benfica can't travel to London and back, but they can travel to Athens and play a game and can travel to Rome as well. It's uh, It'll be interesting to see those, those two ties here yeah, in neutral venues. So... My tips for this out of the five games would be Manchester United. I think they'll have enough to beat Real Sociedad. I think uh, Bruno Fernandes shows his class in these games um, and they've certainly uh, got enough firepower about them as well. I think Slavia Prague could beat Leicester. Spurs to beat Wolfsberger. On the fence between Benfica and Arsenal, but I'll give it to Arsenal. Um, And I think Rangers will get past Antwerp. I think Rangers could have the easiest tie out the lot, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I going by Rangers do well in Europe, and they've shown they're a well-drilled side domestically, and they can they can cut it in Europe. With just look at their the performances against Benfica and, and things like that, they they should have enough to to beat Antwerp. So it's early stages, but who would be your outside tip to win the Europa League? Oh. Uh, oh, I don't know actually I don't want it to be an English team I, I don't like I don't, I, uh, and all the English fans have just switched off <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys it's just a football thing um, I really don't know actually I don't, who are you tipping I've actually I'm going against everything you've said I'm tipping Man United to win it yeah yeah um, no I really don't know I can't call that uh, I, I I think it might be an English team because there's so many left in it, but I'd, I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get to the um, final. <laughs> it'll definitely be interesting over the next few days to see who does get through. Um, I think looking at the, the ties in both the Champions League and the Europa League, I think most of the UK sides will get through, um, but I'm sure there'll be a couple of upsets. And what was interesting was I didn't actually watch the games last night. I watched them back this morning. I went out a walk last night and as you walk by people's houses um, you can see the televisions in the front room. They were all watching the football um, and I think everyone's kind of really tuned in for this. Um, there's a point here from Kevin Graham and it was something I was actually going to bring up as well. Um, he's saying all these ties should be one-off games. I loved that last season. That was the best part of football coming back last season was these one-off ties because there was no sort of holding off, trying to play for the, the nil-nil and take it back to your own ground. It was really all systems go for 90 minutes. Yeah, and possibly on a moral and public health level, I would agree with that. The only thing is UEFA wouldn't because of TV money. They want the TV companies who have got the rights for the Champions League and Europa League want two legs of Barca, PSG, of Benfica against Arsenal. And if UEFA were to cut that, then the TV companies would have every right to say, well, give us some of that money back then. And it's interesting we speak about that because there has been another thing that's been in the news about European football this week, and it is the potential restructure of the Champions League. 
Um, so if anyone that hasn't seen it, basically the, the idea would be that still 32 teams would qualify for the group stage, um, but instead of playing in groups of four, um, it would be a 32-team league where you would only play 10 games, uh, five home and five away. The games that you play would be based on the pot that you would find yourself in. So back to the pot systems, one, two, three, four. Um, if you're in pot one, you would play two games against another pot one t- uh, side. You would play three games against teams in pot two and pot three. And you would play two games against a pot four side. The idea here being that there would be more games that actually mean something um, and more games that get the kind of big ties like your your Man City's versus your PSG's, your Barcelona, Real Madrid's. Um, at the end of it, it would go back to the league system. The top eight teams would qualify for the, the next round. Teams in positions 9 to 24 would have playoff ties against each other in the form of 9 playing 24, 10 playing 23, etc. And that was how you'd get your last 16. Now, it seems quite a confusing model, Um but it's getting a lot of support across Europe. Do you think this is something we could see over the next few years? And is this the first steps towards the European Super League that teams have been trying to get for the last sort of 10, 15 years? I actually think it's something to try that, that UEFA would be trying to bat away from a European Super League. This is trying to appease the big clubs, especially so that they don't form a Super League. So, and especially the Swiss model that we're, we're talking about where you would have the top teams playing against each other, almost in a similar way to the UEFA Nations League, which uh, came in a few years ago and everyone was confused mm-hmm. about how that works and how that operates. I think we, now that we've seen it play out twice, well, nearly twice to a finish, um, we've started to realise the benefits of it and the pros, and there are some cons to it, but there's, it's, it's still good, it's still exciting, and it's better than friendlies. And I guess, mm-hmm. sadly, the top and elite clubs maybe see playing again PSG against Anderlecht, uh, Anderlecht, they maybe see that as not an appealing tie that they want to be involved in. So, no disrespect to Anderlecht, of course. <laughs> uh, it's... Uh, the, the big clubs, it all comes down to TV money. So what basically in, in the English Premier League, you've got billion pound uh, contracts uh, with Sky and BT. The Italian League, the Spanish League and the German League don't have uh, contracts as as good as that. And they, need, they, they want more of that wealth. Um, they want more of that wealth in Europe. That's where they can get it from. Although the Italian League is potentially negotiating a... A deal quite similar to the Premier, English Premier League, but in order to do that, they they know that they need to be playing against the, the top teams. They mo- need more European football, and if th- the only downside to that would be that something has to give. If there's going to be more mm-hmm. European football, so if there's going to be a guaranteed ten games of of European football in the, in this new Champions League, something's got to give. And in England, we're already seeing that the the EFL Cup could possibly go, or certainly Premier League teams may not take part in it. In France, their League Cup is already gone. I think that's right. And we may we may see that. But there's also, I always see these things from, uh, obviously, objectively as a journalist when we're, when we're reporting it, but my own personal view, I always see it from a Scottish point of view and how mm-hmm. what mean for, for Scottish football and I actually think especially with the introduction of the Europa Conference League and the Europa, with the Europa League um, mm-hmm. going down a bit, more teams playing in Europe can only be a good thing for Scottish football and if at the moment there's going to, for next season there's going to be five teams playing in Europe but if if there's less games in the Scottish Premiership and more teams playing in Europe, the likes of Aberdeen, Hebs, or teams that you might see in the Europa League or in Celtic and Rangers, obviously, would have would be able to attract players by saying there's not just qualifiers in, in six games. There's actually going to be 10 games here that you can play. And that should be an aim for Celtic and Rangers to be part of this. And it's a huge selling point to say, look, there's 10 guaranteed games in this Champions League and you'll you'll be playing in it and you could attract better players. And that all increases the quality of, of Scottish football and it filters down in that way. Definitely. And you can see the points in the comments coming through both for and against this. Um, one of the kind of 
big things I've seen um, when people have been reviewing this is they feel as though it's very franchise esque, very NFL, um, where there's so many teams already qualifying. And that asked the question. I don't know what the criteria for qualification would be, whether yeah. it would continue to be like the top four sides from England that automatically qualify, top four in Spain, etc. Um, and there's a, a good point coming in here from Mark, and he's saying, you remember the European Cup when only the champions from each country were involved? And that that is the case. It, it's called the Champions League. But yeah. I, I, you look at the winners over the last couple of seasons, and right, in fact, probably right back to probably the year 2000, a lot of the teams that win it aren't the champions of their own country. Um, yeah. A lot of teams that make it to the last four, the, the final, aren't champions. So it is almost like a European Super League already. Yeah, but I guess the way the way it's going, you either you either jump on with it or you get left behind. That's the thing, mm-hmm. and the the rich clubs are going to dictate this. And if if you're not on board, you will get left behind. And we've possibly seen that with the way some some of the changes have been made, like for example, the top four leagues in Europe getting four slots. And it is up, it's up, it's up to the league how they determine. Um, it's up to an association, sorry, how they determine who goes into the European spots for each country. Mm-hmm. Obviously, for something like the Champions League, it is going to be the top four. But, like, for, ex- for example, Scotland used to have a Scottish Cup winner, um, and other countries have the Cup winners going into the Europa League. Um, it's up to the associations. But, yeah, they probably, if they did this this new format and this new Swiss model, they may maybe look at changing the name from Champions League. I don't I don't know what their plans are for that. But yeah, you're like you're saying it's the traditionalists would obviously want to see the champions in the Champions League and mm-hmm. playing against each other. But it's not the way the the football world is working at the moment and you either go along with it and have your say or you get left behind. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot of people say money talks, and I think that's the way football, sadly, in my opinion, is going. Um, but we'll, we'll see what comes out of this. Certainly one to keep an eye on to see what the criteria for qualification is, whether previous winners will have a bit of a extra kind of stimulus towards qualification, um, if that boosts their coefficient, etc. But one to, to, to take an eye on. Um, so thank you to everyone who's joined us so far on the Football Insomniac. We are seeing your comments coming through and we will bring some of them up on um, later on when we speak to Anthony about his career Um, so far. One coming through here actually from Tony Cassidy who says, via Opta Joe, Kylian Mbappe is only the third player to score a Champions League hat-trick against Barcelona after Tino Asprilla and Andrei Shevchenko joining an elite group there, isn't he? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Great start, man. and last week we were joined actually by Anthony Haggerty and one of the talking points was the um, death threats that Mike Dean received um, following his red card decisions, um, both of which were rescinded, um, but he was receiving horrible, horrible threats um, to both him and his family. And then last night uh, I actually seen a tweet that you, you put out and it talked about a game in the English Championship, English League 1, Paul Lambert's. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Paul Lambert's Ipswich, um, and the referee there, Darren Drysdale. Now, for anyone that hasn't seen it, definitely go and take a look at it after this. There's a, a kind of an interesting decision made. Um, I think it was simulation he was getting booked for, mm-hmm. the player. Yeah. Um, and he took the, the player in question here is actually Alan Judge. He took a bit of a a bit of offence to being to to that and started giving it back to the referee and the referee who is actually an RAF sergeant I found out um, actually didn't stand for it and the two of them went head to head now this is the first time I've ever seen a referee react in such a way Um, and the response to it online has been very mixed there's been a lot of people saying it was good for referees to stand up for themselves others saying if this was a player he'd have been sent off how can you expect someone to respect someone yeah, so how can you expect someone to respect someone? That was a bit of a tongue twister. Um, mm-hmm. When they're squaring up to each other, how do you think this one's going to play out? I My personal view on it is I see that in terms of how, how can you enforce the law and expect to be respected for enforcing the law if you are also committing 
the same kind of acts that we see on a regular basis from players squaring up to each other, going head to head and nose to nose. It was a very brief head to head, but they did, <laughs> did seem like a head touch, and it did seem like it was the referee Darren Drysdale who put the head in. It was yeah a, a bizarre incident. I mean, everything, anything can happen in the heat of a moment of when you're on the pitch. Who knows what was said as well? That is now up to the to the FA to see. I was speaking to Ipswich last night, who said they're not making an official complaint, but they they are awaiting to see what the next steps are going to be from the FA. The FA, it was obviously like ten o'clock at night, just said they're aware mm-hmm. of the and we'll, we'll comment in due course. So but it's it's one to watch and, yeah, definitely a, a very different kind of incident that, uh, involving referees. And, and you've played a bit yourself. You played Sunday League. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't even think at Sunday League level you've ever seen a referee square up to a player. No, I, I haven't. Anyway. <laughs> I usually stay away from any, any fights or anything. We've got a few players who like a bit of needle in our team, but uh, I usually stay away from that. But no, I've never seen a referee actually square up to a player himself. <laughs> uh, it was it was so big. It was on the front page of a lot of the the kind of big news outlets this morning. So um, I think unfortunately there will be um, more that comes out from this. Um, and I think it will be one of those conversations that everyone still in the years to come will want to know exactly what was said between the two of them to have that reaction, similar to Zinedine Zidane and Maserati uh, at the World Cup final. What was actually said? It will be yeah. one of those ones. An Ali McCoy's Neil Lennon situation. Um, people will still be talking about it in years to come. Well, but, Lennon, I remember at the time of that, Lennon did say one day he would reveal what was said. But uh, I think since then they've almost been like, no, I'm not saying it. Or but it's, it hasn't been asked fairly recently, but yeah, who knows what was said. I think I think Neil Lennon also said that if the league got out of control, he would resign. So I'm not sure how much of Neil Lennon's words I can take as gospel right now. Um, but we'll leave that for the Celtic State of Mind show that comes on at 12.30 after this. Um, now, I, I can't imagine the reaction to that last night if the fans were in the ground. Um, and this actually is a kind of segue to the next talking point, which is the, the sort of football roadmap out of COVID. Now, it came out, um, leaked to the press, that the English government is looking at the Carabao Cup and the FA Cup as potential test events to get fans back into the ground um, once the numbers are starting to come back down again. Talking about 30% capacity, which is roughly about 30,000 in Wembley. Um, and potential to have fans in for the Euros. Now, we just saw one of the biggest sporting events in the world, the Super Bowl um, over in uh, America, and that had 30,000 fans in at it. Um, A lot of them had already been previously vaccinated. Others were put into groups and kept so far apart um, with cut-out fans in between them. It does ask the question, are we starting to see the return of fans coming up in the future, can we see the roadmap? Will we get back into the ground soon? Well, yeah, we uh, we will eventually be back in, in grounds. Uh, what I do think is quite dangerous to do is to compare ourselves to other countries and other events. America is not really the example, certainly in, in the Trump era, is not really the example to follow. Um, I know the Super Bowl has been uh, done differently. Uh, since Biden's been in, obviously they're taking the pandemic a lot more seriously over there. But uh, in terms of in terms of the UK, it's it's just great we can even talk about this now. It do, it definitely seems like in in England there's going to be a huge rollout of vaccines next month in March, and once a certain level of a certain number of people have been vaccinated, you can start to get back to not normal life but things can start easing their way back to normal and I think next week they're going to announce how that's going to be and maybe the plan That's in, and that's in terms of the country. In terms of football it's, I mean it would be amazing to get what the EFL Cup Finals in uh, April I think it is. Yeah, it? late April I think, yeah. 30,000 fans at Wembley for that. That is very promising for things like the Euros um, coming up this summer. Um, it'll be interesting to see if 
if Scotland has any plans uh, for test events on a larger scale um, as things go on in perhaps April and May, but uh, t- to see if they can get fans in at Hamden for the Euros because that's going to be important. Mm-hmm. As well. But it's just good we're able to talk about this now, and it, this is what like third third lockdown or so, or whatever it is. Yeah. It's, it's it's almost a whole year we've been in this situation. So to be able to talk about something like 30,000 fans being back in grounds, I think is, is a positive. And there's definitely seems to, there definitely seems to be light at the end of the tunnel for if it doesn't happen this season, next season, there'll be, there there can be something and there can be some fans. And obviously um, down South this season, there has been fans into the games. They were allowed back in for a period. Uh, I think it was maybe a couple of months before they went into full lockdown again. We saw crowds like five, 6,000 at the Emirates and things like that. Did you manage to sample any of that? What was the kind of response from the fans when that was going on? I, I didn't myself because it was all carefully selected um, fans who were in close proximity to the stadium and other checks. Obviously, people who would be members of the certain clubs or whatever. And uh, no, I wasn't, wasn't able to sam- sample it, but yeah, the, certainly the people who were there were glad, were glad to, we spoke to many of them. They were glad to be back in because it's an escapism for so many people to get away. It's, there's so much doom and gloom in the world, seeing the number of deaths, seeing it surpass hundred thousand in the UK. The, from many people that have been locked down alone, it's a great escape football is so much more than just a game in that sense. It's so it's a huge part of people's lives, and you take that away from people, and it it, it has a real detriment to their their own well being. And just in that term, and their mental health and their their well being, it's great to see. It, it was great to see fans back at the games, but my I do think it might have been a bit premature, and I, but I think that's more due to. Uh, governments not uh, trying to appease sort of, trying to appease fans, trying to appease sections of society, and there was a lot of a lot of things lost in translation about how the UK government was handling the pandemic. So uh, now it seems like we've had a prolonged a prolonged lockdown since well, it's certainly down in London. It's been almost since November we've been in mm-hmm. lockdown and. It seems like there is a clear path out of this now, and and let's let's hope so for the benefit of everyone and for football, obviously, because I would love nothing more than to be standing in Trafalgar Square on June the eighteenth in a kilt, drinking before <laughs> Scotland England did win. It seems like well, a bit of a dream still to the, for that to be happening, but I would love nothing more than that. Oh, I mean, uh, as soon as the the penalties were over in the Scotland game, my hotel room in London was booked. So if that does go ahead and we can travel, I'm expecting you to get the first round in. Is that okay? I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot, of my, a lot of my mates have booked flights already as well. So yeah, the booked hotels. It's, I mean, it would just it would it would almost make it worth it. Not worth it in terms of the deaths and, and things like that. Obviously, worth it in terms of what we've endured, what we've had to to deal with to have that party. That's that party for for Scotland fans and, and for. European football. Definitely. Um, and just, if things don't go the way things, um, the kind of roadmap suggests so far, if fans aren't allowed back in for the start of next season, what challenges can you see for clubs in terms of trying to sell season tickets? It's, it must be quite a hard sell, especially not knowing when fans can get back into the grounds. Yeah, it is. And we've got to applaud every football fan who bought a season ticket in, in Scotland. Because in England, they didn't really do that. People stay, stayed with their memberships and things like that. But season tickets weren't, weren't bought, certainly not uh, at Premier League level, because they don't need that money, the Premier League clubs. In Scotland, Scotland is so heavily, the Scottish Premiership especially, so heavily reliant on season ticket holders. And you have to applaud every single fan who has paid money knowing that there was a chance that they would not see a football game live in this in the stadium and knowing that they're paying potentially 600 odd quid to watch a stream that is 30 seconds delay 
because all streams on the internet are 30 seconds delayed. So <laughs> at least, at least I, I get a notification from Live Score telling me that uh, Celtic have scored before I before I see it on the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, but yeah, that's you've got to commend the fans for doing that. But how? So many fans will have lost their jobs. So many fans will have had periods out of work on the furlough scheme, things like that. I think it would be really hard for clubs to, if if it looks like there's not going to be a return with fans, certainly the first few months of the season, they would have to reduce prices heavily. Mm-hmm. And there has to be some way of um, compensation. And I think a point was made in one of... Uh, your other podcasts and the, the Celtic State of Mind podcast is that mm-hmm. uh, they would, the clubs, if they were asking for a refund for the fans or you went to five games that you hadn't paid for, they would happily take that money. Uh, they, they would happily ask for that money back. So that there should be some some level of compensation or increased value or you get the European games for free, for free or you get the cup games for free, something like that. There has to be something for to to make it uh, make it worthwhile to buy a season ticket for next season. Yeah, definitely. And it will be an interesting summer to see what lies ahead, um, especially in terms of fans getting back in. It would be incredible, as you said, to see 30,000 at either the Carabao Cup final or the FA Cup final, it would be incredible. And as you say, you're on the first round in London if we manage to get down for it. So yeah. make mine's a double, okay? <laughs> um, but moving on, potentially, um, if we are allowed people back into our, our homes soon, then the potential would be to have people over. Now, you and I uh, both know that if you have someone over in your house, if you have a couple of people over, it's an empty, it's a gaff. It's every other Scottish word. But mm. dinner parties are more accustomed to the London lifestyle. Um, have you been at a couple of dinner parties since you've moved down there? Oh, yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's so popular. Cheese and wine nights, things like that. It's, it's, all, <laughs> it's, still, it's still not normal for me, but yeah, I've been to a few. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I have a guest on, um, I do ask them to tell me who would be their dream dinner party and it's from the world of football Um, so we're looking for four people from the world of football dead or alive um, because we found this machine a bit like Cinderella when the clock strikes 12 they have to come back but we've got them back for that time period Um, and they're over in the Joseph household first of all and we spoke about this you have to cook you can order in I suppose but you've got to provide some sort of food what's on the table well, I'm glad you said you could put order in because when you said like, <laughs> I have to cook and I was thinking, what can I cook? I was at work as well, too busy to, <laughs> to think about what to cook for this imaginary dinner party. Let's say we're ordering a, a KFC bargain bucket or something like that. Oh, <laughs> And, um, I'll, I'll buy the KFC bargain bucket and we can all share the chicken. <laughs> I wonder if this will have any impact on the people that will be coming into the Joseph household. But well, who I, is the first one there? <laughs> Who's the first one there with a bottle of wine? First one there, and probably would bring a bottle of wine, is that man behind you, Henrik Larson, who is my hero and was my hero growing up. I mean, I, I can't express <laughs> how, how much his, he meant to me growing up and how much his goals meant for Celtic and everything that he did for the club and stayed. He could have gone to Man United. He, um, he stayed at Celtic and then saw out his seven years there before going to Barcelona. I've got so much respect for that because you don't really see that much in the modern game as well. Um, so, yeah, it would be Henrik Larson. I've never had the chance to meet him. I hope to still one day meet him and thank him my, personally for everything he did. And who knows, he might end up at Celtic in, in the coaching capacity at some point. But, uh, yeah, I would I would love to meet him and love to have him around for, for a chicken wing or two. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone hasn't heard or saw last week's Football Insomniac with uh, Anthony Haggerty, he told a fantastic story about Henrik Larsson. Um, he was the journalist at the Daily Record at the time when Henrik left Celtic and he was tasked with the job of describing all 242 of Henrik's goals for Celtic. Um, he said it was a, a great job and he was told by Henrik himself 
that his son loved it. It was a fantastic keepsake. Um, and he met him at a, a kind of reception thing at Celtic Park a number of years later. And he signed every single page for him. Um, whilst looking at the goals, the goal against Rangers, the, the famous chip over Stefan Kloss, and goes, Bert Konterman, <laughs> and just breaks into laughter. Uh, it's a fantastic story. Check it out. It was on last week's podcast. Um, but Henrik Larsson, a complete hero, as you said, behind me here for a, a good reason. He's in my office because he is a hero. Who would be joining Henrik at the table? Um, sticking with the uh, last, last Celtic man as well I've got here, um, Tommy Burns. Just a true Celtic man, Celtic legend. He got everything about the club because he was part of it. He understood everything about it and just loved to to chat about it. I'm very interested in, and love the kind of sociology behind uh, clubs that are were founded for reasons not only for football. And uh, he's, he's someone who can live it and live the dream of every Celtic fan and also understood what it meant to, to everyone and stayed humble through that. And again, another person I'd sadly never, never met, but I would, I would have loved to, love to have met him and uh, love to have had him, had him round for dinner. Any, um, any Celtic fans that are watching, um, if you ever get the chance once this kind of scenario is over, um, to come to the Greenock Celtic Supporters Club and within there, there is a wall which is dedicated as a mural to Tommy Burns. And it's that image of him on his knees with his hands like this um, after the the kind of title celebration. He was one of the, the nicest men. We had the chance to meet his family at a Tommy Burns supper. Um, and his impact on Scottish football and world football um, is incredible. You'll never hear a bad word about him. Even guys like Ali McCoy are full of great stories about him. And it said a lot about him that when it was his funeral, you had Walter Smith and Ali McCoy as two of the Paul Bearers. So um, it was, he's an incredible man. Who would be joining Tommy and Henrik at the table then? It would be Pep Guardiola. And I just find him a very fascinating character from wearing his sort of like protest t shirts or. or funny t-shirts that he wears sometimes in, in press conferences or things that have a big impact as well. I just find him quite a fascinating, fascinating person, the way he speaks in, in press conferences. And also I would love to just talk football with him and just pick his brains on um, certain aspects of the game and certain aspects of the modern game that he has almost created as well. And I think, I think it would be a fascinating chat, a fascinating person to have. And perhaps after a few beers, he'd be he'd be quite wild as well on the karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a karaoke song yourself? Oh, oh no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's yours. <laughs> uh, we'll get back to that later on. Um, <laughs> you on the spot. Who, would be, <laughs> um, who would be joining Pep, Henrik, and Tommy at the final seat of the table? The final person would be Juan Mata who I will not uh, hear it anywhere else. Perhaps Marcus Rashford's going up there in my estimations of, of that. The one Mata is the nicest man in football, and I've been lucky to work with him a couple of times on shoots um, in my old job. And I will always remember I had a very much, when I was first dealing with him, because uh, we wouldn't, a lot of players when we were doing these kind of shoots, it was very like Soccer AM style videos that would be challenges or an eating thing uh, mm-hmm. competition. And a lot of the time you'd be dealing with the agents of players, whereas one matter would just happily give you his number and say, deal with me and we can sort it out. And I had a pinch myself moment where I had a missed call on my phone. I was actually on the toilet. <laughs> and I got my. <laughs> And I had a missed call from Juan Mata, and it was one of those pinch yourself moments where you've got the World Cup winner, call, a World Cup winner calling you, and he is just genuinely the nicest, nicest man. Um, he's always got time to do extra things. He's always happy to chat, and certainly when we were on the shoots, and it was, it was, it was great. And yeah, I would invite him round just for for that hospitality. So it does ask the question now that you've said that, 
who is the most famous person in your phone book? Oh, um, I don't know. It might, it might actually be him. It might be him. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to, like that. Yeah, maybe him. <laughs> <laughs> so joining one at the table is Henrik Larson, Tommy Burns, Pep Guardiola, and it is a KFC bargain bucket. I mean, yeah. I think that the stories and the the kind of laughter would probably get over the fact that it's KFC they're being served. The, f- the chicken might still be lying at the end of the night. I'll be eating it. But yeah, it's fantastic. Um, if you do have your own dream dinner party, leave it in the comments and we'll bring it up. Although I do have to ask you this. Um, Daniel Skeen has come in saying, Tony's karaoke song is Walking in the Air. That is I true. I a live rendition myself. <laughs> Every Christmas I used to send, well, I still do send voice notes to my mates. Daniel Skeen is one of my closest mates. And I would send a voice note of me trying to hit the high notes of walking in the air. But the Iron Brew, <laughs> the Iron Brew version, which we all know and love. Because it's not... Oh, brilliant. We've released that advert. Dan- Daniel, if you ever want that to hit the press, send it over to us. We'll put it out. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and KMX Street 44 coming in um, just saying God bless Tommy Burns exactly um, so we move on now um, and discuss a bit about your career um, obviously a lot of people know you from Sky Sports um, breaking a lot of exclusives um, and we've had quite a few questions that have came in um, about your time at Sky Sports but first of all how did you start your journalism journey where, where did it all begin um, well, basically from starting from school, so I did, was doing work experience at my local paper in Aberdeen, the Evening Express, in my school holidays, and um, as much as I'd love to set a good example for people doing their hires and things like that, I actually failed higher English, and that's all I needed at six years at school, but I was mucking about, I was doing my football coaching badges in charge of the first year football team, I was, I was mucking about, so, but there's still a pathway and um, probably not the traditional one now, but perhaps more old school the way I got in. So I did a year at um, Telford College. And, sorry, I've just got a notification. No, I'll click that. And uh, a year at college and at Telford College in Edinburgh, and that got me straight into second year at uni uh, in Aberdeen. But I was there for two months and an opportunity came up at the Evening Express in Aberdeen as a uh, trainee football journalist, which I took in uni. So I'm 29, but I've been in journalism 11 years full time now. I um, had five uh, amazing years learning my trade in Aberdeen. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, do news as well as sport and, and then do online stuff, which got me a job at the Mail Online in London for all my sins, perhaps. Certainly not, not, not the, they don't align with my political views, but it was a great one of uh, one of the world's biggest uh, news websites. And certainly uh, I learned probably the most I've, I've learned in journalism at Mail Online and how they do things and how, uh, while you don't have to copy their stance on on editorial, editorially, the way they do things is is spot on, and they've got a great business model there, and one I think many places are trying to replicate. But uh, I then left Mail Online after three years and went to Kika Media, which was like a new media kind of video production company, and we did stuff Chinese and Japanese mobile networks. It was it was all promotional. Stuff so we did stuff for like tag Heuer watches, um, but with Man United players testing out the new thing that shows your golf drive or Juan Mata doing an eating challenge, um, like things like that. So it was it was very like soccer AM style videos um, for the Chinese and Japanese mobile network. So that helped me build up a lot of contacts as well because you're dealing with agents and sometimes players themselves, um, and obviously at Sky it's helped me out feeding back into my Scottish contacts, especially for transfer windows. So, yeah, I started at Sky last March, um, just before the lockdown. So I was onboarded remotely pretty much. Um, It's been great fun. And my dream when I was young from 11, 12, 
I wanted to work at Sky Sports. And um, so I, I, I do sometimes pinch myself that I'm there. I don't take it for granted. I do realize that I'm in a privileged job to be able to talk and work and find out the stories that, in football. And yeah, I ne- never take it for granted because I, I do realize it's a very lucky, a lucky thing to be in. And obviously, you spoke about this before, um, coming from the BAME background um, and getting into journalism. It's not something that we see um, very often. Um, and for a long time, um, there, there hasn't been that representation in there. Do you think that's starting to change now? Are you seeing um, more BAME journalists being taken on into more high-profile roles? Yeah, I mean, it's a very complex issue as to why that hasn't been the case and why it's it's starting to be. It's obviously great that we're now, it's a hot topic of discussion and it's on, it's on the agenda and it has been on the agenda for nearly a year constantly. It's the first time I've seen it like that and I want, in terms of fighting racism and things like that, it used to just be before where you'd have a show racism, the red card month or show racism, the red card week. And then you'd forget about it in terms of the national narrative would be forgotten about people like me would never forget about it because we deal with it on an everyday basis. But this is the first prolonged campaigns from the media, from politicians, from um, campaigners, lobbyists of we need to do something about racism. And as much as there hasn't been major change, I wouldn't expect major change to happen so soon. But as long as we can keep that narrative going and never drop it, we can. it always comes up in conversation. It's always forefront. And if people think it's becoming stale, like taking the knee, it almost reinforces, uh, some people think taking the knee has become stale or the message has been lost. But it almost reinforces, for me, the reason why you should keep doing it because in a few months' time when fans are back at games, you'll have um, if players are taking the knee, you'll have a kid asking their mum or dad, well, what, what, what are they doing there? And then that message gets relayed and then that <laughs> leads to progression in society, if you know what I mean, because it, it starts from a young age and racism starts from a young age and it's yeah in terms of if if you know, if young if kids if kids are seeing that live at a game and asking their parents why why these people are doing that and you're saying it's against racism you, they, they'll be intrigued they'll be intrigued with it or they'll try and copy the players doing that or copy their stars doing it. and it, the the message stays and the narrative stays so despite it despite it not always being a major story it is still there, if you know what I mean. No, definitely. Um, so let's talk about something which is almost um, not really spoken about in media, and it's about what teams journalists support. Now, there's, there's a, a couple of questions that's came in about this, and Fraser Ogilvy brings one up here saying, does Anthony believe there's such a thing as a biased journalist in the media world? Um, now, it, it, can I ask the question, I mean, a lot of times you see journalists saying, oh, I'm a St Mirren fan, oh, I'm a, um, an Aberdeen fan, oh, I'm a Ross County fan. But there's very few that actually come out and say, I'm a Celtic fan, I'm a Rangers fan. Um, and what has been, the way you were kind of brought to Celtic's fans' attention was you admitted quite openly you're a Celtic fan, you're working in the media. Is there a sort of, like, a wall that needs to be broken down there to for journalists to come out and say, by the way, I support one of the big two teams. Definitely. And it's the only way we can properly progress because you look at the media and Tony Haggerty, obviously an open Celtic fan you had last week. Um, It's very rare for a journalist who's working in Scotland to admit that. And I can sort of understand that. And when I, even when I was in Aberdeen, um, I, on my Twitter and things like that. No, I wasn't openly a Celtic fan. Obviously, Aberdeen's quite a small place, um, so people knew. Um, but since I moved to London, I was like, I don't care now. It's a huge part of who I am. Being a Celtic fan is a huge part of my life. And to hide that is hiding part of me. So it's I I, I don't see the issue with it. I, I can see... I can almost see why people don't, because the abuse, if, if I was living in Glasgow, for for example, the abuse I would receive maybe 
just going being recognised in the street if I was working in in, in Glasgow and uh, reporting on Celtic and Rangers constantly. I can maybe hide from that being in London, but online you can't hide from it. And I'm I'm open about being a Celtic fan, and I think to progress, I think I would encourage more journalists to do so if they are a Celtic or Rangers fan, if, if they want to. They don't have to disclose it if they don't want to. But um, certainly don't hide who you are. Be Just to be yourself on online and, give, and be open and admit it. But that doesn't take away my objectivity. When I'm reporting on something as a journalist, I'm reporting it objectively, whether that's talking about Rangers or Celtic. But when I'm expressing my opinion, I'm expressing my personal opinion. But that is completely different to actually reporting the news or reporting something that might be critical of Celtic or reporting something that might be in praise of Rangers. But, um, yeah, I'm I'm happy with people knowing who I support because it's a huge part of, part of my life. But I, I, I think it, it's definitely a wall that could be broken down if more were to, more were to be open about it. Well, we're just going back to some of the, the watchers and listeners' questions. Tony Cassidy comes in saying, how does AJ get on? AJ, I mean, that, that's a great... You've been compared to Anthony Joshua already. Um, <laughs> how, how do you go on with Charles Patterson and Jim White and who's your favourite football commentator on Sky? Uh, I get on more with them fine. They're, they're colleagues, they're workmates. So, <laughs> um, obviously, Charles, up in, Charles is up in Glasgow and work with him regularly, constantly on the phone or text about certain things and stories. And Jim White... Is was in last night. Uh, we get on, we get on fine. We know, we know our allegiances there, but we, we just have a, a good laugh. We know we, could, we have a good chat, an in-depth chat about football in general and Scottish football especially. But um, yeah, sorry, what was the second part of the question? The, Favorite commentator on Sky, and if it's not Roy Keane, why? Yeah, well, we, Roy Keane in terms of pundit, and also Mika Richards is just for that infectious laugh. I mean, Brilliant. It's, it's great any time he's in. And, uh, yeah, uh, probably Roy Keane or Mika Richards. Oh, uh, the kind of the stuff that was leaked out um, about Mika Richards showing Roy Keane his dancing on FIFA. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Um, a question coming in here from Lewis Laird. Um, how hectic can it be to work during some of these transfer windows? And there was another question that actually came in. I'm, I'm still trying to scroll to find it. What has been your biggest exclusive that you've had in your time at Sky? Um, in terms of transfers, probably Albion Ayeti signing for Celtic. I mean, uh, I think I was the first to break that uh, Celtic were interested in him and followed it closely um, due to having worked with him previously on a um, shoot in my old job. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, yeah, it was probably that and just in terms of following all those little updates because I think he was due to be booked in for a medical and then had second thoughts and went on holiday. And then then Lennon was the one that saved the deal um, in the end so a few weeks later and he finally arrived and signed. Um during the transfer window, it is extremely hectic. And so when uh, the last two transfer windows have been on, I've been the news editor for the transfer desk, and you've basically got to be aware of absolutely every transfer going on and coming in from reporters and the stuff you're also doing yourself. And it's it's a 24-hour job because I, um, my girlfriend gets annoyed because I was doing the transfer window. I'm on us always on my phone and she's like why is it and I was like this is important we need to get this over the line or something like that and it's uh, it it can be frustrating for her but yeah it takes its toll so after the windows you'll find our main transfer reporters like Darmish, Cave, Brian will all take a week off or two weeks off whatever afterwards because it takes its toll for, for a whole month especially you're just constantly on it and aware and uh, yeah, mental. And the fact that sometimes we're working from home as well, it can be it can be difficult. So yeah, it definitely takes its toll. Um, and Lewis just comes back to say Anthony's openness about his support for Celtic is definitely an inspiration for a student journalist and a Celtic fan like myself. Anyone who hasn't seen Lewis's work before, he is part of the ninety minute cynic team. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, just. 
a couple of other comments coming in. Um, Celtic fans, Anthony Joseph is class. Enjoy his take on stuff and his reporting. So uh, another yeah. big up to yourself. Um, and finally, there's just kind of there's a question that I think anyone who is a journalist would want to to know from someone like yourself. Um, and what is the the advice you would give to someone now? Someone like Lewis, um, like a couple of others that are on the State of Mind team, um, there's Amy Canavan, there's Natasha Meikle, there's a lot of ones that are looking to get into the world of journalism. What would be the tip from yourself, working at Sky, um, to help them to develop their careers and get to the level that you're at right now? Yeah, just one simple thing is work experience get work experience and do as much as you can. And now we're in an era and um, with, with social media and podcasts and live, live things like this. And like Lewis was pointing out that he does the cynic um, and people doing the state of mind, you can create your own content. You can get a huge following. You can, you can well, publishers and producers and companies will will like will see what you're doing. You can you can show off your skills better than ever before. You used to have to phone up your local paper or national newspaper and ask for a week's work experience, and that would be your way in the door. And it's it's the same principle, but you can do it yourself now, and you can show off your work. You can show off your talent. And there's just so many ways of having your, your work published and your work out there. I would say definitely try and create some kind of hub where you have a website and do as much publishing, get involved in a, a Celtic state of mind if you're a Celtic fan or any other publication, a Man United one, a fancy in Aberdeen one, whatever, and just get your work published as much as you can and do as much reporting as, as you can and you, you will get recognised and, and you will have a portfolio there or a website there that when you apply for a job somewhere or you're lucky enough to to get your own business in, in journalism, then d- people can see your work and they can, sh- you can, they can see everything you've done. And there's, it's, it's almost better now. Well, I know it's a saturated market, but it's, it's almost better now and easier now to create your own content. And... Um- <laughs> Amazingly, we've been on for over an hour now, um, and we're just about running out of time before the Celtic State of Mind uh, broadcast comes up at half twelve. I will be on with Amy Canavan and Paul John Dykes as we look ahead to the game against Aberdeen this evening. We'll also be discussing the news of L- Liam Shaw. Is it Liam Shaw from Sheffield Wednesday signing on a pre-contract? Do you know a lot about him? Is a, a good talent to come up? Um, well, certainly, Sheffield Wednesday fans rate him highly. He hasn't played that many games. I mean, he's he's just burst into the team recently. He um, can play centre mid. Also been told he can play in defence as well. Uh, but a 19-year-old who seems like a good a good deal anyway. Celtic will be paying about £300,000 uh, compensation for uh, his development. So, good bit of business, I would say. I mean, you, that's the kind of market um, Celtic have got to be looking in now because of um, Brexit and the difficulties. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely a good signing yeah, on paper. And one we will be discussing about very shortly in 15 minutes' time. But uh, from now, Anthony, I just have to thank you very much for joining us today on the Football Insomniac. I know there's been lots of questions, but we've not had time to answer them all. Where can people find you on Twitter that aren't already following you? Uh, my Twitter handle is Anthony R. Joseph. So, yeah, you can give us a follow. That'd be, that'd be nice. <laughs> send, a <email>. <laughs> send an email. Colin, thank, thanks for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been great to chat. Um, it's been great, um, and it's been great having you on. Next week, I will be joined by Alison Conroy from Clyde Super Scoreboard. So if you have any uh, questions for myself or for Alison, um, get in touch on Twitter and we'll get them asked, uh, asked for you. Um, but until next week, a big thank you to Anthony, a big thank you to everyone who has been in the comment section. This has been the Football Insomniac and until next week, take care and stay safe.